From 1967 through 1968, Captain Larry Garlock commanded Bravo Company of the 1st Battalion, 2nd Brigade of the 27th Infantry Wolfhounds of the 25th Infantry Division at Coochie Base in Ha Nia Province, South Vietnam. In this book, his book, Badger Bravo 6, Wolfhounds in the Mist, published in 2016, Captain Garlock gives his account of the combat operations in which he and his company were engaged, the actions and attitudes of the officers in his command, and the actions and attitudes of the superior officers under which he served. My name is Larry William Garlock, and I'm originally from Everett, Pennsylvania. I was in the infantry, and uh, I got there uh, when I was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, commanding a basic training company, and uh, decided I wanted to go right then. And I, I went to division headquarters and volunteered to go to Vietnam. That afternoon, a jeep came out and picked me up <laughs> and said, you're on your way. <laughs> Uh, uh, right away, I was sent to um, oh Fort Gordon, Georgia, and there was a special school there for uh, training officers, you know, uh, on what was going to happen over there. And when I got to Vietnam, I found that nothing they told us applied at all. <laughs> that school was worthless. <laughs> they were teaching us like we were uh, supposed to go into a, a small village over there, and um, uh, do things for the people to uh, uh, win the hearts and minds of the of, of the Americans, you know. In other words, get them on our side and uh, figure out projects that would help them there. And uh, of course, I went over to the infantry, and we didn't do that. Uh, the only time I got to Hamlet is when we bivouacked there, maybe overnight or something. And um, all we did was cause them grief because <laughs> while we were there, we would get incoming fire, you know, and then the people suffered from that too. So uh, that school was worthless to me. I was there about, I guess, four or five weeks. Uh, and I, I don't know how that was supposed to prepare me, <laughs> you know, to, to go to Vietnam. Maybe it prepared some officers, you know, they actually went to do that, but uh, not me. So you weren't prepared to go in for combat originally? I didn't know anything except uh, what I learned in basic training. Or uh, Now, I did go to officer's basic training in Fort Benning when I first went into service, and you learned some things there, but uh, not not to command a company or anything. I had nothing, no preparation for that at all. Uh, when I got to Vietnam, um, the Wolfhounds were a special outfit there, uh, Helleborn Infantry. Now we did everything in choppers, and uh, they were always needing officers. My orders when I went to Vietnam was to go to 101st Airborne. <laughs> because that's where I said I wanted to go when I volunteered. I did have orders for that. When I arrived there, um, uh, wherever you check in, I can't remember how that was now, but you got there to where they assigned you someplace, you know. I showed him my orders, and he just set them down. He said, you're gonna go to Coochie with the Wolfhounds. I said, but my orders, he said, your orders mean nothing. You're needed down at Coochie. <laughs> so that's where I went. And when I got there, um, that battalion commander told me, um, that was Colonel Parrott, who was there then. He wasn't quite as bad as the second one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he said, I'm assigning you to Alpha Company. He said, and you're going to be like an intern for a, a little bit of time, you know, until I need a company commander. And then that'll prepare you. That'll give you some experience. So I was supposed to shadow, you know, the Alpha Company commander. Well, what happened was the Bravo Company commander got shot in the knee. 
and he was out. So uh, it was only two weeks that I was shadowing that guy. So, you know, you didn't see a whole lot. So he said, now you're going to be the commander of Bravo Company. So I, I knew about nothing. The only thing I knew is what I would imagine that I, was, I should be doing. <laughs> okay. Notice the first chapter of my book was okay. about that. So well, I was a young man that, you know, wanted some uh, combat experience, which probably was kind of dumb, but I was a young man <laughs> that thought I want to get in on that. So that's why I did it. And what rank did you go in as? Pardon me? What, what was your rank when you got there? I was a captain. I made captain when I was commanding the basic training company at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So I was a captain when I went over there. And you had to be a captain to uh, command a company. Okay. And um, your handle, your call sign was what? Mustang Bravo 6. Mustang was the call sign of that battalion. And uh, Bravo was for B Company, what I had. And if you were a company commander, they called you a six. So that's why I was Mustang Bravo 6. But who was, a, who was a, above you? Who was your ranking officer? What was his call? Uh, the first one was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Parrott. And uh, I, I got along with him very well. But then when he left, uh, he, he, his term was over and he rotated to the States. But then... Uh, was he Bravo 5 or...? No, no, he was... He was Mustang 6 because that was a call sign of the battalion. So he was, uh, Mustang 6 meant he was the battalion commander. But then uh, we got, I'm trying to remember his name now, the one I didn't get along with at all. That was over 50 years ago. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, okay. So you went to Vietnam and how long before you saw some combat action? once you were there? It was less than a month. I was in that first battle in, uh, in the first chapter of my book. But, um, and I didn't know what to do. But um, you think you're there, you know it's bad, the men are in trouble, and you gotta think of something to do. So I, th I thought, well, I'll try it. And it turned out, turned out fine and uh, be because of it uh, they gave me a silver star for that operation uh, which which really pleased me but um, that was an action there where maybe what I was doing was stupid but it worked <laughs> what was it that you did uh, all all my company was laying on the ground with their heads down because there was so much fire from the enemy. They were keeping us pinned down, so we couldn't fire back much, I guess. And I could hear my squad leaders yelling, you know, at the men trying to get them to shoot. But uh, what I did was I crawled over uh, toward the, uh, there's a canal there on the side. I, I crawled toward the canal and grabbed a couple of the guys to come with me. I think I had four of them best I remember. I had my radio man with me. And we, when we got to the canal, uh, we got down in the canal, and the water came up to about my chest on me. And uh, the other men were following behind me. I can remember my radio man wasn't very tall. <laughs> he had water about up to his chin, but he was coming. And uh, I wanted to go up the canal far enough that we would be behind the enemy because I knew where they were, you know. Well, you're not sure you're far enough or not. So uh, we crawled up on the bank to look, and I could actually see all these black pajama soldiers, you know, Viet Cong. And there they were shooting at my company, and we were in, far enough in behind them. So um, I kept motioning for everybody, you know, what to do. And we climbed up on the bank. And I whispered, on three, you know, fire, fire at them. So um, I can remember 
uh, the fear I had. Uh, yeah, that's the first time you ever get anything like that. I can remember the feeling I had through my mouth, my neck, you know. It just felt like, uh, I can remember it felt like everything turned green. <laughs> Out of fear there. And you can feel it on the back of your head. But um, you don't know if those guys are going to shoot or not. You might be the only one. <laughs> but um, I counted three, and they all opened up like crazy. Right, right at those VC. And... Uh, so it really worked. That that broke the battle. Uh, the rest of them just took off. Yeah, you know, but several of them. We got several of them. I think we had five. I think it was five dead ones laying there, and a couple wounded when we were able to, you know, climb up on the bank and go toward them. And uh, something that really happened there that I still have today. I was moving with my men. We were sweeping toward them, and there was a lot of brush there. And just suddenly, I came upon a VC that was wounded. He was laying there like this with his rifle. And when he saw me, he started to move his rifle toward me. I had about five rounds left in my magazine, and I put them all in him. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's the first time you ever shot at anybody, you know. And that gives you a feeling. But I picked up his rifle. It was a Chinese, what they call a chai calm rifle. I picked that up and I still have it today. It's at my house. I was able to bring it home. But uh, the, next, uh, the next day, I remember, um, I got this terrible feeling about me that I had killed somebody. And, but then you also think, but it's him that did, not me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I remember... Uh, you know, I didn't feel so bad about it, uh, about shooting at him. But another thing that really got me was um, there was one of the VC there. This happened a couple times. He was wounded pretty bad. Now, we would take wounded and bring him back to the mass unit at uh, Kochi to uh, t treat their wounds. You know, the same as an American soldier. But uh, they had two medics there tending him because the rest of my company had come in when I signaled them. And uh, they wanted to tend to him, you know. And uh, he was he was there spitting at them and uh, waving his arms at him and everything else. Then he actually took out a knife and tried to keep him away from him. And one of the men that I had with me, he, he couldn't stand it. He went up and just shot the guy in the head. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I, I can hardly believe he did that, but uh, he had so much stress on from the situation, you know, that uh, he wasn't going to let anybody act like that. But uh, he he didn't what I guess he didn't know how to react from that. But he was sitting there like this with the rifle, and I was afraid what he might do. I told the one sergeant, "Get over there and get that rifle from him." So he did. The sergeant just jumped on him and <laughs> took the rifle and then sat with him, talking to him. And uh, the one sergeant, he said, you know, that was a terrible thing for him to do. He, I, do you have any charges on him or anything? I said, let him alone. I said, uh, he's here to fight the enemy. Um, he did it that way, and the situation I can, I can excuse. I said, just see that he... Uh, is taken care of and his stress is relieved, you know, and he can back with his unit to go on. That's an experience that may be good for him. Um, I didn't want to do anything to any of the men, you know, that um, were, were fighting the enemy like that. How did it turn out for that man? That later turned on? out fine for him. He actually came to me, um, excuse me, this stress is getting to me a little. But uh, he actually came to me some time later and thanked me. <clears throat> but uh, one other situation, the same thing happened. Um, oh, that's when uh, Alpha Company, you know, that commander was still there. He turned out to be one of my best friends, and he ended up getting killed in that operation. Uh, he, he got shot in the kidney, 
and they took him back to Coochie, and his company was left there, and they were getting decimated by the enemy, and uh, that's when I, that's when I called the division commander. That was something you were never supposed to do <laughs> as a company commander. But Alpha Company was just getting decimated because I'm listening to the radio and I know what's going on. First, I called my battalion commander and I said, you know, I was in reserve at the time. I was on an old Japanese airstrip. And uh, I said, send me in there, you know, to relieve Alpha Company. He told me to shut up and get off the air. So, and what he was doing was covering his ass. That's what he was doing. He didn't want anybody to know that Alpha Company got in that situation and that would be his fault. Well, then I thought, I heard the division commander on the radio and I thought, I'm going to call him. So I did. Well, right away, another, as soon as I said, uh, Lightning Six, this is Mustang Bravo Six, you know, another officer jumped in the conversation. What do you want, Bravo Six, you know? Because he knew I wasn't supposed to do that. Well, then, no sooner did he say that until the division commander did get on the radio. And he said, I know who you are. He said, if you're sure you're right, he said, go. <laughs> but uh, so I did. And uh, we went in and relieved the Alpha Company. And um, later, it happened again. There was a Viet Cong there wounded. And he was acting the same way that that other one did. And one of the Alpha Company soldiers shot him while he was laying there. And it was the same thing. I told the sergeant to grab the rifle from him, you know, and sit with him. But I didn't do anything to him either. And he turned out all right. That's an experience they'll never forget. <laughs> what is it like to lead a company of men into a war in, into battle like that, knowing that some of them may not come back? Well, the most important thing I had was trying to keep from getting lost. <laughs> uh, they would give me an order to team up with another company somewhere, you know, because of what the operation was. And you're moving through jungle and stuff, you know, and uh, you think, how am I going to find them? And am I going to get there on time? Because if you don't come there, you're putting them under a great pressure, you know. Because you're not there, they may be in big trouble. So first of all, the stress was terrible about me getting my company to where I was supposed to be on time. And then you think, uh, I got to remember everything to do with my platoons, you know, so we don't get in trouble ourselves. But uh, what the men will always do, they, they walk. They walked in bunches, you know, it's like they thought, you know, uh, uh, walking with other ones made them more safe or something, in which I did not. You know, you got to keep them separated. But, uh, and I was always watching to see if they didn't bunch up like that. But, because uh, that, that would cause a lot of, of problems. But the stress was terrible about getting your company there. Uh, on time, you know, and in the right place. But um, then my platoon sergeants were very good. I had never had to worry about them setting up, you know, positions when you got there. I would tell them, this is it. Here's where I want, you know, each platoon, get your men set up. And then I'd give them some time and I would make a little tour. And they always had them. Uh, situated the best way you think it could. So I was so grateful for them. I had uh, one platoon leader uh, from Cuba. <laughs> and uh, trying to think of his name. I can't. But anyway, uh, and then I had one. Um, he was white and he was older. That was his third war. He was in World War II, uh, Korea, and now in Vietnam. And um, he was just a lifer, you know, you remember what they were. And uh, he was very good. And the, the, my third platoon leader was a real small black guy. And uh, one thing you did not do is call him Pee Wee. <laughs> 
I remember he was so good at being a platoon leader, they always said he considered your socks just as important as your rifle. <laughs> but uh, I told you about the Pee Wee thing. He was one of about 10 kids, you know, from down in Alabama, Boogaloosa, Alabama. I remember. <laughs> but uh, I remember him telling me that. But uh, his mother was a prostitute, and he said they lived in a one-room shack, and he said they had one light bulb and one outlet, and he said that's the best they lived. And he said, well, he was just honest as he could be, and he said at school, he said he got clothes from the team. He was a, a team assistant, you know, whatever the right name of it is. But uh, he was so honest, he said all the players would give him their watches and wallets, you know, <laughs> to take care of and then pick them up later because they trusted him that much. But uh, the coach would give him T-shirts, you know, from the uh, team, so he'd have that to wear. And he said the coach would even buy him other clothes because he was so valuable to them. And, uh, and he told me, he said one day a social worker came and uh, were taking all the kids, you know, to this uh, school, whatever it was. And uh, he went, he went too. And when he got there to that special school, his sister went along. And he said the first thing his sister did when they got there was tell everybody to call him Pee Wee. <laughs> but the, he said that he talked to the Army recruiter there where he was in the area there, and he got him in the service. He told him, he said, some of the most famous military men in the world were small, you know, and, uh, who was that French commander? Um, Lafayette? Napoleon. Napoleon. Okay. He was just a little guy, you know, and, and he named a couple more, just, very small guys, you know, who were very important. So he said, you don't have to worry about your size. And he got him in. And, uh, oh, I, I, would, I would have done anything for that kid because he, he did such a good job. So uh, that took a lot of the pressure off me because I knew, you know, they were taking care of everything. But one thing I demanded all the time, that all the men were informed about what was going on and what was expected of them because they became good soldiers that way. These American boys, you know, you didn't have to worry about it. If they knew what was going on, they, they did their job. But too often in the other companies, they weren't told very much. They didn't know where they were, what was going on or nothing. And that scares you. You know it would. But I tried to keep that fright away from my boys. Sounds like you took a personal relationship, a personal, uh, you went beyond to take care of them, to keep everybody informed, and to keep that circle tight. Well, if I took care of them, I knew they took care of me. And uh, it worked. You know, I, uh, when we got in bad situations, uh, they, they didn't do things that they did in the other companies, like disregard orders and stuff like that, which would put everybody else in danger. Um, they had confidence in me that uh, what I was saying, I meant, you know, and that I would do. And uh, the worst battle we were in was when that Ernie Flowers that uh, you heard, you know, down at the restaurant, uh, that's when he got wounded. And uh, there, uh, we were really in a bad situation. We were vastly outnumbered by the enemy. And um, I got separated from the battalion. And uh, our, our battalion commander just, he, he'd do some things that just didn't make sense. He wanted me to come and join them over there because he wanted another company with him. I knew what was going on. <laughs> he, he thought, the more I have with me, the safer I'll be. I, kn I knew that's what he was thinking. But I couldn't do that. We had to crawl. He told us to crawl right through the enemy, you know, and get over to where he was. 
Well, we just got started when Ernie and a couple others got hit, you know, while they were crawling. And when Ernie got hit, he was crawling to help another kid that got hit. And that's why his butt was up in the air a little too much while he was crawling. But um, in, that, in that situation, uh, later on, that uh, battalion commander came to me and he said, you disobeyed my order to you. Uh, you called back and said, you're not going to do it. You're staying right where you are. He said, well, it turned out okay. And he said, <laughs> he said the uh, brigade commander came and actually complimented you on your position and how it turned out. When we were, we got a frontal attack, you know, and uh, we were able to, uh, to sustain ourselves. But he said, I'm going to let that go. You disobeyed my order. And uh, I knew why he was saying it. Brigade commander told him to keep his mouth shut about it. <laughs> I knew about that. But um, I knew right then that I was going to have to, to figure what the best thing I could do in a situation and not worry about, you know, what this battalion commander wanted because I knew he always had some alternative uh, reason in his head, you know, about why he did things. So I thought, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do what I think ought to be done. Another thing I did, too, was a lot of praying. And I know that helped. And I, was, <clears throat> I would always pray for the whole company, not just me. And uh, that, that works. I, I agree with you. Now, it's not like you didn't have a whole lot of regard for, for uh, upper echelon um, officers. Was that because they weren't there to survey what was going on, or they were just going by what they thought was going on? i tell you what I think it was. All of these upper echelon officers wanted promotions. They all had stars in their head. In other words, they wanted to be a general someday. <laughs> so they would do anything at all to make it look like they were successful, even if it cost some of the men their lives. They would do whatever they thought, you know, would help them as far as getting promotions. I know that's what they were doing. And uh, I didn't think that way because I knew I wasn't staying in. I had a job to do and I wanted to get my job done and go home. But uh, in the conversation I had with someone, I, I still don't regret some of the things I said. Uh, I know I really put myself in jeopardy. I could have been relieved of command. But I, I, I was so grateful that the brigade commander, that full colonel, he liked me. Uh, <laughs> It just so happened I turned out to be doing the right thing, you know, when he was observing me. And uh, he just liked, liked me for general reasons, I guess. Often we sat and had a beer together, you know, and he didn't do that with anyone else. <laughs> okay. Now tell our viewers where you were located and just why there was so much combat in, in that area that you were in. This was the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is where it emptied out into South Vietnam. And our mission in that area, the Wolfhounds, you know, was to stop them from going into our uh, province there, Haunia province. Uh, that was our, our mission. And uh, the local Viet Cong were, were trying to keep us from doing that. So we were battling two things. Anybody coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the local uh, Viet Cong units, and uh, we had a lot of help, I, I will say that. It wasn't just our battalion. You know, the helicopter units and uh, artillery fire from Gucci and, and plus the Air Force, they were on call all the time for us, and that's why we were successful, I think. Now, during, during your, your battles, you were flown in and dropped in by helicopters? Yes. 
Okay, and then you have to fight your way back or out of that area. Well, uh, when the intelligence officer there in the brigade found out where a VC unit was, then uh, like my company might be assigned to go there and see if I could get them. So we'd load up in the helicopter, 10 helicopters and two gunships is what you went with. And you land somewhere, you know, where uh, the enemy is there so you can engage them. But uh, sometimes uh, it wasn't as many there as what they thought and sometimes there were too many. <laughs> So, but uh, you had to be ready for that. Uh, the, the gunships were very helpful. As soon as we landed, the gunships would strafe the area, you know, to uh, kind of neutralize them so we could get in position. And that would help. And then if I was having too hard a time, I would call for artillery. I had a second lieutenant artillery observer with me, and he would call back for artillery to hit where they were, to kind of break them up and make them leave or uh, something, or blow them up or whatever. But, uh, and the Air Force, uh, if it really got bad, uh, I would be reporting to uh, the battalion commander. He would call the Air Force to come in. Those uh, F-105 uh, fighter jets, you know, they were both bombers and fighters. But uh, they would come in and drop about a 200-pound bomb right <laughs> in the area there. But the Viet Cong, what happened a lot, those little uh, OH-13 helicopters is where the artillery observer would ride. And if they saw one of those kind of circle in the area, they started running right away because they knew that, that was the one that was calling the Air Force to tell them where to come in and bomb. <laughs> So you'd see them taking off and running like crazy, and then you hear a jet coming. So they knew ahead of time they better get out of there. But the problem is, uh, sometimes the uh, orders didn't get understood very well. Um, what happened in one place, I was moving, I was ordered to move through the canal area there on down to the main river. So we were doing that. But uh, our battalion commander had called gunships to strafe that area. He didn't realize I was that far ahead. They come in and he strafed us. Several of my men got hit and uh, I had two medics in the company there. And it's very ironic, the two medics both got hit. <laughs> so, and I, I could see bullets snapping on the ground, you know. How they hit, you know, how it, kicks up, how it kicks up a little bit of dirt. I saw, I saw that, and, and at first you don't know what it is. Then you think, they're shooting at us. <laughs> so uh, right away I got on the radio, and I yelled, get out of here, you know, you're shooting at us. And he said, I, he said we were told to shoot. I said, get, go, <laughs> whoever you are, stop shooting. So they, they left the area then. And I told the battalion commander, how did that happen? And he, he just wouldn't even answer me because it was his fault. But uh, another thing that happened that kind of perturbed me, it was, it was much later on uh, in an area, uh, they tried to involve the Vietnamese as much as possible. You know, the ones that were flying jets and things. So uh, the enemy was in a position there and uh, they called in Air Force, well, it was Vietnamese pilots. Well, I mean, they know English, but they don't know it that well. And, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't understand a lot of the lingo we used. And what happened was um, I got called and uh, I was told to put out smoke from my area so they would know where not to shoot. Well. The jet pilots there, these Vietnamese thought, they said, smoke is where <laughs> you're supposed to go. And uh, they, thank goodness uh, they didn't hit me, they hit the company beside me. And 30 men were wounded. And uh, you know how they would try to cover up things. In the morning report later, 
you know, when it, when it's all written up, they never mentioned it, that that happened. That really perturbed me. And I thought, they're lying about this whole thing. <laughs> Probably the division commander, you know, told them to cover that up. That would look bad for him. <laughs> See, I was a grunt, so I know nothing about the morning reports, but there were actual reports after each incident. Oh, yes. And after a, a large engagement of any kind, we would have a division meeting of all commanders, including me. And uh, the division commander would question all of us, you know, to uh, see what happened, what went wrong, you know, what should have been done, or what went right so we can do it again. And uh, that was what he should do. But the morning reports were supposed to be based on that. But too often they were written up by a staff officer who wasn't even there, you know? <laughs> now, wow. Wow. Right now in the archives down in Washington, there's supposed to be all the morning reports of everything that happened, you know, during the Vietnam War. And, um, I wrote a letter down there that I would like copies of uh, morning reports, you know, from uh, in a certain time period. And the letter come back, you know, we're too busy for that, sir. You can come down here and look it up yourself. <laughs> so the morning reports would include the, the dead and the wounded. Oh, also, yeah. And, um, Supposed to be very detailed. Yeah, the enemy that were killed and all that. Like I said, supposed to do that. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the things. Um, uh, there was an incident with your pants. Tell me about that. Uh, what? Your pants. Parents? Pants. Pants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that. We were in an area that was very swampy, and often you had to walk in water up to your waist. Well, somehow I split the back end out of my, out of my pants. So uh, my butt cheeks were exposed. And I thought, oh, I don't want to spend the rest of the day like that. And so I called uh, back to Coochie. And I said, get me a pair of pants out here. Told them my size. They called back. We don't have a pair of pants your size. So I called. That really perturbed me. And I thought, I got to be desperate here. So I called back again. And I said, you find an officer uh, up to the rank of captain, not above, take his pants and send them out to me. I said, I'll deal with him later. Well, then uh, they laughed. I could hear them laughing on the radio, you know. <laughs> but I said, I mean for you to do that. Well, of course they didn't. But the uh, brigade commander that liked me, you know, he called. And he said, uh, Bravo 6, I'm about your size. I'm going to land and give you my pants. Now, uh, I'll tell you the story of how it happened. But first, I want you to know why he was doing that. The Stars and Stripes newspaper, he knew that would make a great article in the Stars and Stripes. That's why he wanted to do that. <laughs> he didn't really like me so well. You know, he just said, I could make the newspaper. But he, he landed and took off his pants and, and made me take them. I kept telling him on the radio I didn't want him to do that, but he, he, he said, I'm coming. Well, then uh, he had to walk back to his helicopter, you know, to leave, but we were having sniper problems, and he got two shots at him while he was walking to the helicopter. you think he would have took off running, but, you know, he was a middle-aged guy with kind of a belly, and he would have fought, he have fell down for sure, you know, if he tried running. And uh, he was in his skivvies, long skivvies, you know. And uh, he didn't want to fall on the ground in his skivvies, you know, being a full colonel. But uh, he made it to the helicopter and took off. And then later on, it was in the Stars and Stripes that that happened. But uh, at least I got a pair of pants in the wear. <laughs> We got back to Coochie. I asked him if he wanted his pants back. He said, no, <laughs> I got new ones. <laughs> Especially during the fact that uh, 
in, in, in the jungle in the bush, you didn't wear any underwear. So that no. was another thing. That <laughs> no, your underwear, your underwear acted like a net for all these little wiggly things <laughs> in the water. That's a swamp, you know, and uh, there's all kind of stuff in the water. Okay, and uh, tell me about the second lieutenant in the firefight. Yeah, I can't remember his name. That, that'll never come to me. But he was a Mormon, a uh, tall, blonde-haired kid. Looked like the kind of Mormon you'd see, you know, knocking on doors and stuff in the white shirt. But uh, the Mormons teach them that they have to work hard to be successful, you know, in what they do. And he was trying too hard is what it was. He seemed though he had only been there like two weeks, but it seemed like he was going to be fine, you know, because you could tell he was doing everything he could to, to be a good platoon leader. But then he got in that big battle, and um, his platoon was being really under fire. And uh, the preponderance of fire belonged to the enemy. In other words, his platoon was having a hard time, you know, firing back. Because that pins you down. You can't shoot. But uh, he was trained at Fort Benning to be a platoon leader. And you see that all the time. The platoon leader is supposed to say, follow me. Yeah. And uh, so he thought, I better lead my platoon into the attack. <laughs> so he jumped up and he yelled, well, I saw him wave his arm. He says, follow me, and I could hear him. And he took off toward the enemy. And he went maybe 50 yards. He was almost to them. And uh, I saw him go down, because the enemy was, they kept up their fire, you know. I saw him go down, and you naturally think, he's been shot to pieces, you know. And he just lay there. And uh, after we gained uh, control over the enemy, uh, in other words, proponents of fire, we moved forward to go into that position to where he was. There he lay, and he wasn't hit at all. He simply fainted. <laughs> when he saw nobody was with him, he just fainted. And <laughs> it was, but uh, after that, he was there several months, and he's, he still did a great job. But I bet that's an experience he never forgot. Okay, so so you were there um, how long before you finally get a break and get a chance to go on R&R? &R? Oh, probably three, four months. Okay. And there's a story on R&R &R where you really didn't get any rest at all. What yeah, that was going to be a second R&R. &R. Anyway, we had an R&R. &R. It turned out pretty nice. I got a good rest, you know, and uh, we uh, had, a, had a good time. I was with Roger Taylor. So you can imagine what a nut he was. He, he takes care of you, though. He was a worldly guy. He knew <laughs> how to handle himself in all situations. I didn't know anything. But um, there was a good R&R. &R. Well, then he was able to uh, get us another R&R. &R. And that's one where... Uh, he said, I'll take care of everything. Well, one of the helicopter pilots was going to go with us. He was a gunship pilot. Nice kid. And uh, the three of us were supposed to get down to Saigon where we would, you know, catch a plane. Uh, now, where are we going? Singapore is where we were going. And... Uh, we got down to Saigon, and we couldn't find the place we were supposed to report to. So uh, we saw an MP jeep coming. It had two MPs in it, and uh, Roger waved them down. And instead of asking them where the place was that we were supposed to report to, he said, do you happen to have a list of all the off-limit places here? <laughs> it's like, they said, yes, sir. And we carried it and gave it to him. After the Jeep pulled out, he told me, he said, now we're going to have a good time. <laughs> In other words, that's the only places we're going. <laughs> so we spent the evening running around to these bars that we weren't supposed to be in. And uh, 
I was scared the whole time. But uh, one, one thing that happened that really scared me, it was like a month before that, two of the officers out of the brigade there were down in Saigon and disappeared. No trace of them at all. And while Roger and I were down there, we were in this one, uh, I guess you'd call it a bar, what they had. But these uh, Vietnamese girls want to sit with you, you know, and uh, what they're supposed to do is get you to buy them drinks. Call it Saigon Tea, you probably heard that. Oh, it is, all they have is, uh, it actually is like iced tea in a glass. It's supposed to be whiskey. That's what they get and, and, and charge you for it. That's their job. So uh, you try to keep them away, you don't want them anyway. But the one sat with me, and she's a good looking girl. Looked like she's probably half French, you know. But uh, sitting right with me, and I, th I thought, boy, I like her. And I asked her, do you want Saigon tea? And she acted like she was really insulted. You know, they acted that. And um, we kept talking, she spoke English a little too well, and that kind of worried me. And I got to thinking, I wonder why she likes me. I'm not that good looking, you know. <laughs> there's, there's other people in here better looking than I am. And, and then I got to thinking about those two officers that disappeared. And I thought, I wonder if this might have something in that, you know, going on. So I told Roger, I said, let's go somewhere else. So uh, we were walking out and she came right with me. And she was actually holding my shirt as she was walking behind me. And I was afraid I was going to get away. And um, it scared me. And I thought, something's going to happen here. So I told Roger, I said, we got to get away from her. He said, what do you want to do? And I, I thought it didn't matter if you heard me or not. I said, let's run. We ought to be able to outrun her. So <laughs> we, we took off running as fast as we could. And uh, she couldn't keep up. So we got rid of her that way. But Roger thought it was so funny that I was scared <laughs> of her. And he told me, he said, she just likes you, that's all. You know, uh, you were going to have a good time at you guys. I don't care. I was scared. <laughs> okay. Now, we go back to Vietnam. Tell me about the officer in the helicopter explosion incident. Oh, when he got relieved of command. Okay. That's, that's Roger Taylor, and we became great friends. And uh, he was from Tucson, Arizona. And uh, he was that company commander, Delta Company commander. There was a uh, Chinook helicopter that went down in the jungle, and it was full of ammunition and stuff. And they were too afraid, you know, the enemy would get, it, get to it and take all that stuff. So they ordered Delta Company, his, his company, to go there and secure that helicopter, make sure, you know, all the contents in it would be safe. So while he was there, uh, they called him again and said, uh, no one's coming to get the ammunition, we want you to blow it up. And they, they sent all the uh, C4 out to him that he would need for that. So he set all the charges there and uh, he said, when are they coming to pick me up, you know, the helicopter? And they said, we'll let you know. Well, he said all the charges, and he said it wasn't very long until he got a call. They're on the way. And he had already lit the fuse <laughs> for, for the charges. But he was the kind of guy that he liked a challenge. And he thought, we ought to be able to get in those hauling hoppers and get out of here before that blows. I knew he's a, yeah, he told me later, he said, I knew it was going to be close, but I had to see, you know, if it was going to work. Well, it didn't work, because as the helicopters were approaching, the whole thing blew up, and it was a bad explosion. A lot of ammunition in there and stuff, you know, and a lot of it hit the choppers. None of them got knocked down. No one got hurt, but the helicopters, were, several helicopters were damaged pretty good, and... Uh, the battalion commander really did not like Roger at all anyway, because he was a real problem. And um, he got on the radio to tell him that he was relieved of command. You are done. 
And I can remember him yelling, you know, there's a helicopter coming, you pick you up, you get on it because you are leaving. <laughs> and what what I remember about, uh, you want me to get into when he's going to Travis Airport. Okay, uh, afterward, uh, I was having a beer with him in the makeshift officers club we had there, you know. And uh, he said, I wasn't supposed to rotate for like two or three weeks yet. He said, but I was told I'm leaving tomorrow morning. <laughs> they want to get rid of me. And uh, he said, I got a problem, Larry. Maybe you can tell me what to do. He said, I got a message and a letter that when I land at Travis Air Force Base, my American wife and kids and my German wife and kids will be there to meet me. <laughs> he said, what do you think I ought to do? I said, well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, they know all about it. Women always do. And I said, they'll be waiting for you. And I said, I'll tell you what I would do. You get out of that airplane and run like hell. Now, I haven't seen Roger since. I don't know how that turned out, but um, I'm very curious about it. I couldn't think of anything else to tell him. <laughs> but that's the kind of guy he was. He just lived on the edge all the time. <laughs> tell me about that book, why you wrote it. I'll tell you, one thing I had told my wife when I uh, first married her, I said, I got two goals in my life. I want to build a house and I want to write a book. Well, I did build a house, but uh, the only thing I could do about writing a book was simply to write about my service in Vietnam. And also, I was thinking, my grandchildren, you know, your prodigy, ought to know about my service there. And uh, I thought this is what would be a good thing to do. So I, I really worked hard on that. Uh, you don't. When you're a novice like I was, you don't write a book like in a week or something. It takes you a year or so. And it, it took me a long time. It was probably two years before I had to complete enough that I could contact a publisher. One thing uh, that I really wanted to include in the book, but the last chapter uh, in there when I went to North Vietnam, uh, they, they called me in. And there was a General Crooks, I remember his name was, talking to me. And uh, he, he said about this mission that uh, needed to be done. And he says, I have to have two, uh, two special officers in command there. Uh, they, they will share the command. And uh, he said, we thought maybe you you know, we'd, we'd be able to be one of them. Want to know if you'll volunteer to take that. And I, I remember I said, first of all, what is this thing about sharing command? <laughs> I said, if I go, I'll be in command. I, I'm not going to mess with someone else that had different opinions. So uh, he said, all right, if you take the job, he said, you'll be the commander. He said, by the way, you're the only one that <laughs> would talk to me anyway about it. <laughs> I was going to be it no matter what. And uh, that scared me a lot because we went to uh, Thailand, it was. Flew it into Thailand. There was a, uh, an American Air Force base there where I got uh, briefed on what was going to happen. There was a, uh, I, he was a lieutenant colonel uh, in the North Vietnamese Army in charge of supply and stuff. And there was a death in the family. And they knew that there was, the whole family would be together at this one home. And I was supposed to fly in there and uh, capture that uh, lieutenant colonel. They wanted him. But they actually thought that um, he was someone else, and, and they were just using that as a ruse, you know. So, uh, and he said, kill him if you have to, but bring him back. So uh, we went, and uh, it was successful. Um, a lot of relatives got killed and wounded. <laughs> thing. But uh, 
that that kind of uh, uh, damage on the side there, I, I couldn't help because uh, there was also a North Vietnamese unit there, military unit that was supposed to provide security for. We had to handle them too, but uh, we were able to overwhelm them, and uh, that officer was killed. And uh, I remember uh, the one sergeant. He said, uh, "Why don't you just cut his head off and bring it, bring it back?" I said, "No, I'm not doing that." And I said, "I want him carried up." So what we did was take turns. You know, you get two guys, one each foot, and drag him behind you, and drag you back to where the helicopters were, and we took him in. Now I remember I had a bad time on that helicopter. There were two pilots, you know, uh, the main pilot and, and his co-pilot there. Well, that co-pilot was kind of a surly guy, and we were we threw that off, dead officer on on the helicopter, and he said, "Get that piece of crap out of here," and uh, right now, and uh, I said, "He's gone," and I said, "You shut your mouth, or I'm going to wrap you on the head right now." And that pilot right away told us both to shut up. He said, "You can take him, but just shut up." You know. <laughs> The other men got in with him. We got back. He was the wrong guy. But we got one that actually outranked the one we were going after. And uh, so that that was a big thing. We got, uh, it was a brother-in-law of, uh, of a, a, a general, I believe it was, North Vietnamese. And, and he, he was just given the job, you know, because he happened to be the guy's brother-in-law, I was told later. But he, he had an important position. But uh, then later, um, I went back up there, and I can't remember exactly what I went for, but uh, the adjutant there, I said, I need to see General Crooks again, you know, uh, before he leaves. And he said, there's no General Crooks. <laughs> and... Uh, I said, well, he's the one that told me about that mission. He said, there was no mission. He said, that never happened. He said, why do you think that you were given a top secret clearance? I said, yeah, I wondered about that too. He said, that was to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, uh, that was something that really grabbed me, you know. He said, that never happened. And you're to be quiet about it. <laughs> so if you had been lost, then you never existed. That's exactly right. If I had been killed up there, and it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> I can't remember his name, but there's a little background on that you need to know first. He was in uh, uh, a battle there where the whole company was pinned down. And um, his, his squad leader was a, really a good man. I remember his name was Campbell. And uh, he was one of these lifers, you know. He, he wanted to be a certain rank. He was squad leader, never wanted to be promoted. And he just wanted to stay that rank to his whole, through his whole career. But he was a good fighter and quite a drinker. <laughs> and uh, this boy... Uh, wasn't listening to him, and uh, he he was telling him what, what he wanted him to do, and he kept yelling back no, and uh, he said I'll go over there and uh, whatever he said to him, and he was afraid that boy was going to come and shoot him, because the boy stood up with his rifle and was walking toward him, and uh, that sergeant would have killed him, but uh, I saw it. And I yelled, you know, and this kid dropped down. But then all of a sudden, after he hit the ground, a bull came and, and hit him. Uh, I forget now whether it was in the butt cheek or on the back of his leg there. But uh, I just really burned him, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was like he went out of his mind and uh, just charged the enemy all by himself. And he was spraying him, you know, with his... Uh, M16 there on automatic. And actually, it changed 
the proponents of fire. It shocked them so much that our guys were able to, you know, to get get firing again. So that was a heroic thing he did. He got hit across the side of a face. A bullet cut, opened his cheek right up, and uh, he went down. And I guess just laid there holding his head. But uh, that sergeant later uh, went to him, and uh, he, he said, as soon as I went to the kid. He went like this because he's afraid, you know, what the sergeant was going to do to him. <clears throat> and the sergeant praised him, told him what a great thing he did. Excuse me, this, <coughs> this gets to me. But uh, the sergeant then told me, you know, what he did. And I gave the kid a medal. And uh, <coughs> uh, he became a uh, fire team leader. And then later the squad leader himself. And that's when they got on a helicopter to go somewhere. And, um, you know, the helicopter is not a smooth ride all the time. And the men are just sitting on the floor. And when some have some, some of them, you know, get uh, forced forth. Well, one kid uh, was forced up between the pilots. It wasn't his fault. You know, uh, he just got pushed up there because of what the helicopter did. And uh, that uh, co-pilot, was going to swat him, you know, get the hell back there, you know. And this <laughs> this boy, uh, oh, I remember his name now, Sean Liebergott is what his name was. Uh, yeah, that's something easy to remember for someone other than me. But uh, that's when he went up and grabbed that co-pilot. If you touch one of my men, I'll kill you. <laughs> well, Sean had come from a family I described it in the book pretty well, uh, where he had a hard time as a kid. Uh, he had an older brother and sister that were very successful in school. His brother was a great athlete, and uh, his sister kind of was the social leader of the school. <laughs> and his mother, uh, she was big in society where they lived there, and his father owned a big food supply company. But Sean was nothing. All he had was a bunch of uh, things, a collection of things that didn't amount to nothing. And even their housekeeper would give him a hard time. But he went into service there, and he was known as a dud. <laughs> you remember that. But, um, and he got assigned over to my company because somebody wanted to get rid of him. It was all amounted to and then And then this thing happened, and it just changed his life. Troops came from everywhere. Guys, women came from everywhere, lots of different backgrounds and religion. But it seemed like religion, no matter what it was, played a big role in Vietnam. How can you explain that? Well, first of all, I was lucky that our battalion chaplain um, was a very good man, very religious, and he would have services for the men I always attended. And uh, I became close to him, and that helped. Uh, I I felt close to God, but I don't think I was saved yet. Uh, my savings came in kind of phases, you know. But while I was there, uh, I felt like I needed God to help me with it. And I prayed a lot. I know almost every day, I was going to serious prayer uh, about God helping me to make the right decisions. And uh, I prayed for the safety of the company because I, I knew that I would be affected by every time somebody got killed or wounded, it was because of me. So uh, I would pray for guidance. Uh, and it worked. That was the thing because Something would happen later, and I'd think, you know, uh, I asked for it, and there it is. Well, you pray for things, you don't get everything you ask for. <laughs> you know, you don't get it in the way you want it to happen. But then God answers your prayers, and later sometimes you recognize that that was the answer to something you prayed for. And I was seeing that over there. So uh, I prayed for guidance, and he gave it to me. And uh, 
I feel like I'm saved today. I work hard in my church. I'm the senior elder in the church here, and I uh, often think, why would a church want me <laughs> to be an officer like that? But here I am, and I'm there, and I felt like the day is going to come that I feel like I'll be accepted up there. Uh, so I have a part in every church service. Uh, I do what's called a sidebar, you know, right before Gary's sermon. And uh, the congregation likes it because I ask a couple times, you know, I said, you know, be honest with me. Uh, do you want me to continue this or not? And they said, no, we look forward to it. So I'm not smart enough to have it do a sermon like Gary does. He is very good. But I can do these little sidebars. You know, just in for, I often take holidays, things like that, like I did with Easter. Uh, two Sundays I did something on Easter that, that wouldn't be included in a sermon, but it's just extra information that the congregation might. Like uh, first Sunday, I told them why Easter comes on different dates every year. Some people don't realize that, but it has to do with the spring um, equinox, and uh, that's March 21st. Easter is always the first full moon after the spring equinox. That's why it's on different dates. Uh, you don't get a full moon on the same date every year, but that's when Easter is decided. So uh, they thought that was interesting information. Something like that, you know. But uh, often I think, what am I going to do this Sunday? You know, I, I'm about out of ideas. But God puts ideas into your head spiritually. And uh, I remember a couple times I knew what I was going to do on the way to church. And you think, well, boy, what I have really isn't that good but I'm going to have to go with it. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, why don't I do this? You know, I'd get in the Bible as soon as I got there while I was having coffee down in the basement before the service, get in the Bible and get it worked out in my head, and I'd have a better sidebar. And you know that's what, that is God helping you, that uh, God wants you to do that. And he, yeah, the Holy Spirit, that's where it comes from. He's supposed to be the comforter. And I believe that's where it comes from. Can I, can I tell you a story about something? All right, uh, uh, Pastor Gary wanted to take us to, oh, it was like 90 miles away or something, to uh, a place where they're having a big Christmas uh, display. Uh, all these little... Uh, uh, um, Places people selling things and stuff, you know, a lot of food and things, and Christmas de uh, demonstrations and things. So he wanted to take us there because he thought that'd be interesting. So he has these big vans, and so we loaded up, and he said, uh, "We'll just all share the cost of uh, me making this trip." So uh, something kind of told me, thought, uh, "Larry, you can afford that right now. Why don't you just tell Gary?" So you're going to pay for the trip. You know, you didn't have to. So I did. I said, I want you to figure it up and tell me what it costs. I'm going to pay you. So uh, later he told me, he said, 90 bucks, Larry, if you want to pay it. So I just happened to have, this is important, I just happened to have, I don't always, $400 bills in my wallet. Took one out and gave it to him. And he gave me $10 change. And uh, here's the thing. The next day, I looked in my wallet. There were $400 bills. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, what is that? Is that the Holy Spirit acting on you or what? I told Gary that, and he says, that's what it is. So, uh, one other time, I had two $20 bills in my wallet, and I put one in the collection plate, 
normally I wouldn't put 20 bucks in because I'm not a rich man. Yeah, I might put a five in, but I put one in. And uh, I guess at the time I wasn't sure I was doing that. And later on, there were two 20s in there again. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, thank you. I'm glad we, we discussed that. But since I've been in that church, mm -hmm. I got to the point where I feel like I am saved. Good, good. And uh, the only reason I started going to that church, uh, my whole family had always been brethren, you know, Church of the Brethren. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a real nice brethren church there in Yellow Creek, you know, the, the uh, town down there where uh, our church is. And uh, my parents would go there, and uh, I started going there then. And uh, I was active in the church, and uh, we were having a, a program up in Bedford on uh, with the Vietnam Vietnam veterans, and I, I can't remember exactly what was going on, but we needed donations, and uh, we weren't doing very good on donations. But at St. Paul's Church. That's, you know, where Gary's the pastor and where I go. That church gave us a check for $100 for the Vietnam Man for our program. And that impressed me a lot. And then I had a little falling out with the Church of the Brethren down there in Yellow Creek. And uh, I thought, I'm leaving and I'm going to St. Paul's Church. And I went up there and I'm very glad I did because they are very strict about using the Word of God, the Bible. And uh, almost every other church I've known, they do some compromising with God's word. But we don't. And that's what I like. And, uh, and that's how I ended up going to St. Paul's Church. And uh, I'm glad I did.